Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. The New York Knicks fall in horrific fashion to the Oklahoma City Thunder, 127 to 123 in overtime with Oklahoma City. It's not a very good team, Alex, missing their top two scores. Yeah, so that, of course, leads us to the question of what is Tibbs doing at this point? And that's going to be the first question that we're going to ask in this pod. What is Tibbs doing? What is the goal here? Then we will try to find some silver linings. We'll talk about Quentin Grimes with another really great game. Evan Fournier with maybe his best offensive game of the season. Julius Randle, other than a, a you know a, a sort of brain fart late, uh, which those abounded in this game uh, for the Knicks, you know he had a fantastic game as well. And we'll just kind of go where the wind takes us. There's a lot bad to talk about right now, so we'll get into it next on Locked On Knicks. <laughs> You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. I am Gavin Shaw, a play-by-play broadcaster covering high school and college sports in New York and around the country. He is Alex Wolf, the editor-in-chief of the Strickland, the finest Knicks website out there. The Knicks are not the finest team to cover right now. A 127 to 123 loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Is this a new low, Alex? Yeah. Yeah. It's like they just keep going lower and lower. You know, I don't know if I I think I already made this uh this connection on here the one time, but I'm gonna make it again. Like For those that watch South Park, it's like the Knicks keep setting the bar lower and we're going to have to send James Cameron down in a submarine to go find the bar sooner or later. And uh, and uh, right now it's it's like headed towards the, the core of the earth right now because the Knicks have just found new ways to embarrass themselves uh, to embarrass themselves on their home floor in this one. They don't don't even have the excuse of a road trip anymore. Uh, You know, they they managed to go up on Oklahoma City at various points in this game. But mostly it was a very tight contest all the way through. Like first quarter, 31-29 in favor of the Knicks. Second quarter, 32-31 in favor of Oklahoma City. Third quarter, 32-30 in favor of the Knicks. Fourth quarter, 21-18 in favor of OKC. And then they, of course, lose overtime 15-11. to And that that leads to a four-point loss. But the thing with this, Gavin, you know, there were so many opportunities for the Knicks to put this game away. And, you know, I, they couldn't do it. And, and Tibbs put out what he thought was the best possible version of this team that could win him a game going down the stretch. And there was a period that got talked about tons during the game in the post game show by like Alan Hahn and, and those guys in the studio. It just there was a stretch where the Thunder didn't score for almost four minutes. But guess what? The Knicks didn't score either. And then that allowed the Thunder to come back. But, I mean, you're facing one of the teams that is notoriously trying to lose games right now. And they're missing probably, I mean, Josh Giddey's fantastic. Trey Mann looks fantastic, looked fantastic in this game as well. You and I look like geniuses because in an alternate reality, they were our picks in the Locked On Mock Draft this past year. Uh, but, you know, they're without – on paper, they're two best players in Shea Gilgis Alexander and Lou Dort. They're two top scorers for sure. It's just like, what are you doing at this point, Tibbs? You know, what is the goal here? Why, why continue to play guys like Alec Burks down the stretch? He of the, you had the stat before, right? Like thirty percent or thirty-five percent or something uh, from on my ups. Yeah, on layups this year. He's, he's at he's at thirty eight percent right now, and he's shooting thirty nine percent from three, which it, I I can't imagine any player has ever done that before. And, and it's obscene. I mean, the the late game offense lately has been like, let's get Burks going downhill towards the hoop and let him try to score layups. It's like, when has that worked? Oh, I know, thirty eight percent of the time. When for most players, that's like a sixty five percent shot. You know, and and that's just the well that Tibbs thinks is worth going back to over and over and over again. And then you look at a team like the Thunder, who this whole year have let guys like Josh Giddy, Trey Mann, you know, uh, Darius Baisley, Isaiah Roby, you know, all these guys that they played, uh, Kendrick Williams. I mean, they, they have mostly 
young players on this team, they've let them take their lumps and play through things as, you know, a tanking team. And now you see guys like Trey Mann really starting to like figure their game out and drop 30 on the Knicks in Madison Square Garden. And, and it's just like, you know, why can't the Knicks do that at this point? The Knicks are now 25 and 33. So they're eight games under 500. They are closer to, I think they're at this point closer to being uh, the top lottery odds than they are to being in the sixth seed and avoiding the play-in tournament. I, I'd have to look at the standings to be sure on that. But it's a close enough margin that it makes you say, I think they should probably just not worry about winning the rest of the year. Not that they're winning anyway. I mean, maybe the best way of losing is to keep doing what Tibbs is doing. But I don't know. I, it, it was especially frustrating in this game to me, Gavin, watching the Thunder, a team that, you know, make fun of them as much as you want for blatantly leaning into tanking, for trading away all their players and getting all these draft picks. And, like, people joke, like, ha-ha, they have, like, half the first-round picks in the next, like, five years. Yeah, yeah, that is kind of the case. And it, the difference between them and the Knicks is that they're smart enough to know to play the people that they're drafting with those picks. And the Knicks don't. And they're playing older players – not accomplishing anything and still losing to teams like the Thunder. And it's just, I don't, I, I'm like out of words right now for what to say about what they're doing at this point. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the root, the core of the issue is, is that this team doesn't have a point guard. I mean, you can argue they're the worst point guard play in the NBA right now. And to me, that's so apparent in their late game execution where, and this was, this was a great note from Fred Katz in his piece on the athletic today, which if you have a subscription, you should go check out. Uh, the Knicks basically have like one play in crunch time situations. And it's, it's to run like a one, four pick and roll with Julius Randall, generate a switch for Randall on the elbow, and then either let Randall go one-on-one draw help, kick out, try and get all the way to the rim, take a pull up jumper as he did in the, in the closing minutes of this game. Um, and it has not worked very well because Julius Randall is quite literally the worst post-up player in the NBA from Fred's article, the Knicks score 86.2 points per hundred possessions on play on plays when Randall shoots or passes at a post-up, according to Synergy Sports. Of the 43 players who post up at least two times a game, Randall's number is, sorry, I was I exaggerated a little, is second to last in the NBA. Um, and a big part of that is he doesn't really generate deep post position on those plays, but that's really hard to do near the end of the game is if, if you try to go deep into the post, you can just swarm the ball. And I don't think this is on Julius because as, as talented of a playmaker as he is for a power forward, the guy is not a point guard. Alec Burks who plays late is not a point guard. Kemba Walker is a point guard, but hasn't really been allowed to play like one. And even when he does and, it, and it points in this game, I thought he played really well and, and bent the thunder defense and got the Knicks offense into a really good flow. He's so bad defensively that he's essentially unplayable. Emmanuel quickly is super far in his own head and it, and it sucks because we all love him. And he's in this game, like give him credit. He made some good plays from a point guard perspective. Also made some crucial mistakes. Still can't hit a shot. Five of his last 32 from three. Now the Knicks do not have that guy. When they get Derek Rose back, they will have a semblance of that guy, but there's just no organization late. There's no identity late. And the Knicks keep blowing these leads and losing this, losing these games because there's not really anyone to assert control when things start going bad. And to your point, Alex, given that, and that is a reality and there's no changing it, and the Knicks didn't make any move at the deadline to change it, why not just play the young guys, let them take their lumps, and work it out, especially since if we're asking that question, even when he can't hit a shot to save his life, Emmanuel quickly is the closest thing the Knicks have to an answer at that spot. Yeah, and you know, to your point too, like quickly made some really good like point guard plays in this game. You know, even if even if he's not making shots, like Kemba Walker made some shots in this game and has made some shots recently, certainly more than quickly has, but quickly's doing more within the team concept to like bend the defense and the team is still playing well with him out there. And I feel like I honestly haven't been on like Twitter a ton, but I feel like quickly's probably getting killed for missing the final shot in this game and for going like 0 for 7. But I feel like on a consistent basis, he he gives the Knicks, you know, probably their best presence at that point guard spot of anyone on the roster right now, sans Derrick Rose, uh, with, you know, the ideal lineup that you want out there, which, you know, at this particular moment with no R.J. Barrett would be like Randall, Grimes, Fournier, and Mitch. You know, I think that, I think that quickly is just going to give you the best, you know, chance of, of breaking the defense down in a way that is going to be productive for everybody. 
and not just for like his ability to get a shot off or whatever, which is basically what Kemba's game is. And then IQ is generally going to be a much more credible defender. So it's like, you know, you and I can see this and the numbers say it. And yet Tibbs still continues to go to some of the same wells. And what's even worse is going to like Alec Burks, a point guard right now, which we've just seen, you know, it just doesn't work. It's just, it's I, I, I was going to say uh, the Burks well has no water. There, there's, there's no water there. <laughs> the Burks well is, is located on Tatooine. You know, there hasn't been <laughs> there water go. there in, in generations, you know, it's like it, for the star Wars nerds out there, a big desert planet with no water that dried up thousands of years ago. Um, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's really frustrating to me at this point and I, I want to see some changes and I just don't know if they're going to happen as long as Tibbs is still coach. And so this is like literally the second or third time I've said this in the last like two weeks, but like they need to move on from him. I think sooner than even this off season at this point, because if they hired Johnny Bryant to be like the heir apparent and, and you know, he's the guy that they potentially want to take over for Tibbs after Tibbs eventually moves on one way or another, then maybe the best time is to do that right now and give him a tryout the rest of the year. Because I just, that I feel like there's nothing left to gain by keeping tips here at this point as, as great as he was last year, he's been just as detrimental to this team this year. And, and I think it's about time that the Knicks just kind of suck it up, deal with the PR hit and just kind of make the problem go away at this point. Well, Alex, I don't know if Bet Online has odds on Tibbs' job status, but they have odds on a whole lot of other stuff. Football might be over for the season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball, BetOnline.net. Is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage and information that you desire. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. All right. Uh, we are back. Segment two. Um, we can we can talk a little bit about the actual finish to this game. It was just, it was, it was so frustrating because I, I thought the Knicks we're going to come out and run the thunder in the third quarter, right after they gave up everything in the first half, maybe that was fool's goal, but the Knicks came out guns of blazing to open the third, right? Everything was going in. I would argue the offense was flowing better than any point that it has all season. Uh, we can get into the specifics. Evan Fournier was a big part of that. Julius Randall was a big part of that. Quentin Grimes was a big part of that, but Oklahoma city behind the brilliance of Josh Giddy, some great shot making from Trey Mann, just worked their way back into this game, Alex and then down the stretch, um, I thought I thought it was over when when Fournier got that steal, the sick throw ahead to Quentin Grimes. Grimes again, just I, we we say it every game. There's something new. The reverse layup. It was almost a triple pump to give the Knicks a two point lead. Darius Baisley comes back down, toast Mitchell Robinson for the reverse, and then overtime. I don't know. To me, I mean, and I guess this just this goes back to the point that we were just making. Everyone just seemed completely gassed. The quote from Julius after the game, um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but someone asked him uh, why he didn't push the pace um, as much in the fourth quarter as he did early in the game. When the Knicks have obviously rolled when Julius pushed the pace. And Julius responded, I probably should, huh? I probably should. But a lot of times I work on our half-court offense every day. Sometimes a lot of times I try to let us come down and try to execute and get a good shot. I, we've already outlined why the Knicks executing the half-court does not work late in games. But something to note here, four different Knicks, play over 40 minutes in this one. Julius Randle at 45, Mitchell Robinson at 41, Evan Fournier at 45, Quentin Grimes at 40. On the Thunder, um, only Ter or excuse me, only Darius Baisley hit 40 minutes. Terrence Mann was at 32, Josh Kitty was at 39. I don't to me, they just seemed like the fresher team in overtime where the Knicks just had zero juice. So you could tell Quentin Grimes missed that point blank putback um that he would have made the entire game. The only reason the Knicks had a chance in OT was because Fournier was just he, he was just on fire. But it, it, it felt like if, if I'm going to rip Tibbs for something specifically in this game, it's that he didn't get the starters a little bit more rest in the early going of this one. And it wasn't that the bench was exceptionally great or anything, but you, you can give Cam Reddish more than an eight-minute run. You can give Obi Toppin, who, who was really frustrated and found a way to score seven points in eight minutes, a little bit more of a run. You could have given Emmanuel quickly more than 14 minutes, and, and the Knicks might have had just that little extra punch to close this one out. Yeah, and you know, it's that's all part of it, right? It's like the the 
bench, to be fair to Tibbs, I mean, which sounds weird to say, but like they have been bad at times lately. And yet, even in some of those games where the bench has been like abhorrently bad lately, he still managed to play top in like 12 minutes, you know, or something like that. Like not not playing him eight and, and Julius 45, you know, in an overtime game. You know, it's just it, it doesn't like I, I didn't understand his rotations at all. I didn't understand his his just stubborn reliance on running these guys into the ground in this game. And like, this is your first game back after a long West coast road trip. Like you're right before the all-star break. This is the sort of thing where I would understand a coach that has been doing this for as long as Tibbs has to maybe understand like, Hey, you know, we're facing the thunder. They're not very good. You know, at least in theory, maybe we should try to, you know, spread the rotation out a little more in this game and kind of get start getting guys geared up for a little bit of rest at the end of this week, you know, like start uh, taking care of them a little better, you know, and uh, we just endured so many injuries over this West coast trip with the RJ uh, sprained ankle. Mitchell Robinson came up hobbling like five times in this game and yet logged what I believe to be a career high in minutes with 41, uh, you know, but was limping up and down the court for a, a couple different times in this game where he sort of tweaked that ankle that he's been continually spraining for the last like couple weeks, you know, and it's just like, just do better. I, I don't know. Like it, you know, I don't understand the, the rationale of, of burning these guys out to the extent that he has been. And, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, there was the minutes police, you know, when Tibbs first got hired of being like, oh, he's going to run everybody into the ground and it's going to be terrible and blah, blah, blah. Like injuries are going to come up all the time. And last year it was easy to kind of write those off because the Knicks, I guess, were just really lucky with it, you know, and and RJ Barrett and Julius Randle never really had any substantial injuries between the two of them. And yet we're like top five in the NBA in minutes per game by the time all was said and done. Um, but like, I don't know. I just, I, I think this year it's starting to kind of rear its ugly head with Tibbs where it's like, he is so stubborn with the minutes distribution and also just kind of an ignoramus as far as like looking at guys on the court and having any idea of how they're feeling, you know, or like their body language suggesting like, Hey, maybe this guy is not doing good. The other day, he did the same thing with Mitch where Mitch was like hobbling up and down the court and Tibbs couldn't call for like an intentional foul or something and let Mitch play on a sprained ankle for like, like seven straight minutes until he was practically falling over coming down the court before finally getting him out of the game on just a regular stoppage of play. And it's just, it's just another one of those annoyances where you just say, you know, how long until, you know, he keeps playing Mitch on a, on a sprained ankle like that. And he ends up, you know, breaking an ankle or something or, you know, doing something to his knee because he's overcompensating for this ankle that he's, that he's overexerting or whatever. And it's, you don't want to think about those things, but if one of those things does happen sometime soon, I think there's going to be a pretty easy finger to point, which is the distribution of these minutes lately. Yeah. Uh, no, no arguments for me. Uh, I want to, I want to quickly highlight some positives from this game because I do think we've got we got some of the best stretches of offense that the Knicks have had all season. Of course, a decent chunk of that is due to the opponent playing a really young team. Um, but I, I think Evan Fournier, this maybe not his game of the year, though the second one or what is it, the third one against the Celtics, where he was just insane. Like the shot making probably gives him that title, but 29 points. Five assists, four rebounds, 10 of 18 from the field, six of 13 from three, a perfect three for three from the line. I just saw it his patience in how he manipulated um, the Thunder defense was really, really good, right? I mean, even like from the opening moments of this game, like he had like uh, a really good baseline drive, like that little like drop off pass to Mitch where, where Mitch missed what, what probably would have been the dunk of the year. And, and then, but Fournier just kept at it in terms of trying to get his big setup. Like he, he drew a double team and had this little like crossover slip pass to Julius Randle, who then threw a lob to Mitch for the dunk. He had, he had like a hook pass to Mitch for another dunk. Um, obviously, we know about like the threes that he hit in OT. But even before that, um, a shot that I, I thought was going to end up ending the game, like the double pump 
that he hit while falling down to make it 110, 106. I, I just thought he was so he was he was very in control. And maybe it was that Oklahoma City was such a young team and, and he didn't really feel rushed by them. But it, it felt like he was almost it felt like like a dad who's like less athletic than his kid, but is just so savvy that he could just torch him every single time. That this this was the dad game from Evan Fournier, and he I thought he was great. I mean, how could I possibly top that? And I, you know, maybe the way that that Evan Fournier is finding this energy to to fuel the dad game is by having some built bars. This is a time of year that you know you guys know how it goes. You and I and anybody else probably starting to think about giving up on that New Year's resolution, or maybe you're not even thinking about it. Maybe it's just kind of happening over time. But not this year. I'm going to stick with my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I actually love eating Built Bars, as it turns out. I don't know if you guys have tried the puffs yet, but if you haven't, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. And most unique because puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy. They're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar. They're a treat and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, and they are all low-calorie, high-protein, and replace candy bars. You can get rid of all of them in your snack spots and put Built Bars instead because you're going to get that same feeling of of, uh, eating a candy bar but without all that guilt because most candy bars are going to fill you with calories, you know, fat, lots of sugar, all that bad stuff. Built Bars only have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and 4 grams of net carbs. And you get 17 grams of protein to go with it to help you replenish after a workout or just give you energy to get through the day. If you're, you know, going back to work or, uh, you know, just going out for a walk or whatever, you get whatever energy you need, Built Bar can provide it with all that protein. So if you want to get some for yourself, go to Built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you will get 15% off your order. Again, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. And we are back for our final segment here, Gavin. Uh, I want to, you know, you highlighted Fournier. I don't have anything to add. I agree. I think that he had a really good game. I, at least on the offensive end, you know, I thought that he unleashed the best of his repertoire with, you know, it, particularly he and Julius. I liked that it finally felt almost like a realized version of what we saw literally back in like the preseason that they then abandoned for 40 games or whatever. And now are just finally starting to sort of refine again, that two man game where they're just sort of working with each other on the perimeter and trying to get one another a shot. And it works really well. Uh, But I want to shout out Mitch who, you know, obviously we talked about in the last segment um, as far as it's troublesome that his ankle really seems to be bothering him. I really kind of just want to like stop holding my breath and get through this next game on Wednesday and then give Mitch a nice solid like weekend change to to have that ankle hopefully heal up so he can hit the the ground running for the stretch run of the season. Uh, but 41 minutes, he had 14 points on six and nine shooting, uh, 17 boards, four steals and four blocks. That's eight total stocks. Insane numbers there. He had, I think it was three steals and two blocks within the first like. Uh, 12 minutes of gameplay for him or something like that. Like the first like full quarter. Uh, he had, he had those numbers. I mean, just insanity. Uh, the offensive rebounds continue to be a huge thing for him. Nine offensive boards in this game. Gavin, I just thought that he was, I, it's not even saying anything different for him at this point because he's been doing this lately uh, pretty consistently, but he was probably the most important player for the Knicks on the floor in this game and just truly asserted his will and was, was the most dominant single force on the floor during this game at his best, which I think that, you know, like everybody on the Knicks, like you already noted, I think that that sort of petered off a little bit down the stretch and he, he was, you know, gas. So it was hard to, you know, get those contests up as well as he was earlier in the game and, and generate those steals and blocks like he was earlier in the game. But, you know, overall, I just thought that his effort was fantastic and that he, he really, gave the Knicks exactly what they needed in this game as he has been lately and, and was a true anchor on both ends of the floor uh, as far as holding down the middle of the court there. Yeah. I mean, I thought this was about the best athletically he's looked all season. Those, those 41 minutes uh, of tying a career high for him that he set last year against the jazz. 
Um, but he was just like on some of those blocks, he, he was just so quick off his feet. And, and it wasn't like sometimes like you'll get a block because someone else plays great defense and you come over and help side and you come flying and you get to it. These were all one-on-one situations. And like he had that one on Isaiah Roby that he sent into just the fifth row. And then on offense, like he, he played pissed in this game and it was great to see because he was just too big and too strong for the thunder. I mean, that dunk that he almost threw down off the Fournier pass, I totally agree with Wally. It would have been one of the dunks of the year if he could have pulled it off as it is. He had the steal where, and then went coast to coast and took off like a couple of feet inside the free throw line, went flying in for the rim, crazy rebound after crazy rebound. And then, I mean, I've noted this a bunch with him this year, but just the positioning defensively. Um, I mean, he, he had a situation was a one on two with, with Terrence Mann, and Isaiah Roby, and, and, and he just sits between the two guys and he's so confident in, in his, in, in his quickness again, which he just so wasn't at the beginning of the year. I think we're all forgetting how awful it was for Mitch and, and how much of a punching bag he was on this podcast and everywhere else, just because he, he didn't look right at all. And now he looks the complete opposite. Like he, he's able to shut down those two on ones. He destroyed Giddy late in the game where Giddy, it looked like he got him on a change of direction. And Mitch was like, Oh no. And just kind of caught him with the left hand. Um, I, I thought he was just great. Uh, Alex, what'd you, what do you think of Julius Randall? Because look, this was a, we, we, we begged for old Randall all season and now we have, six straight games of, of pretty much last season, Julius Randall, 30 points, 13 boards, 10 assists, did have seven turnovers, did foul out, didn't shoot it that well from three, did go seven of seven from the free throw line. I think the status he's made his last, last 18 or so free throws now, somewhere around there. Um, he continues to, again, like some bad plays. He did have that pass that like sailed over Grimes head that essentially ended the game. But I, I thought he was pretty amazing once again. And, for as much as we beat up Julius Randle, he is absolutely doing his part now. Yeah, I wanted to real quick, one last thing on Mitch that I yeah. just happened to think of. 41 minutes, one personal foul. I think amazing. If, yeah. yeah, I think if we could have ever, because I, I thought of that when you said about the, the positioning for him, I was just like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, he never came up once in foul trouble in this game. Because uh, when you mentioned that Julius fouled out too, that kind of like jogged my brain, like, yeah, Mitch, you know, if you would have told me a year ago that Mitch could do 41 minutes with one personal foul, I would have been like, damn. Um, as far as Randall, yeah, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, we are sort of getting what we want. It's unfortunate that the results in the win and loss column are not coming through here. The Knicks have now, oh my God, I don't even want to look at what their current like streak situation is. They're well, currently they've, gone, in- they've gone one in five over these six amazing Randall games. So that should tell you that it's not all him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just, ugh, and oh, their overall numbers, oh, six, six, 10, 12, lost 12 of their last 15 games. I mean, things, ah, things are so bad right now. Um, but as, as far as Randall's, you know, play, I, I think that just like everything else, this is sort of just giving me hope for like next season. Uh, I'm already, I mean, maybe this is, <laughs> you know, we're, we're starting to figure out like draft guests and stuff like that to start getting us into that sort of talk. I'm, I'm already kind of past this season. What I really want to see is just growth from the young players and Julius getting back to where he was. And I thought that he did that in this game and has been doing it recently. You know, you mentioned the tempo earlier and I think that that was something that he didn't even do as well last year, but you know, this year now it's like, he's understood like, okay, I'm not like a 50%, you know, empty gym mid range jump shooter anymore. You know, and I'm not shooting 40% from three anymore. So I got to find new ways to find offense for myself and others. And this is it. You know, we're going to we're gonna push the pace. I'm going to get more layups. I'm going to set more guys up this way. And, you know, he managed to find guys uh, on a number of great passes in this game, obviously, as evidenced by the, the 10 assists. I do think, uh, you know, of course, he'll catch some heat for essentially having that, that uh, turnover that basically lost the game uh, at the end there by sailing that pass out to Grimes. But... I don't think that should override what was overall an amazing game. Like the Knicks without him playing the way that he played in this game would have got embarrassed by the thunder, not just narrowly beaten by the thunder. Would it, they would have been embarrassed by the thunder if it was Randall of like a month ago. Um, and so in that regard, you really got to give him props like for against, you know, every, everything put against him. He, he still, you know, managed to put out a really great effort in this game, despite having to play 45 minutes until I'm sure he also was 
feeling pretty drained by the end of the game as much as an Iron Man as he is. So um, I thought it was a great game for him. I, I hope that this trend continues and I hope that, you know, Randall can keep playing this well to set a foundation for next year because I, I think that that's going to be a great sign for the Knicks going into this offseason. If a big trade is on the horizon at some point, if you're going to potentially be coming into next year with a different coach that will hopefully be more inventive on offense and willing to do more, you know, cool things to get Randall going, maybe play Randall and top in together some stuff like that and put Randall in more of these like run, run, run situations. That's going to bode really well. And, and getting these reps in and playing as well as he has lately, will will pay some dividends somewhere down the line, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think this game just showed what an incredible basketball player Julius Randall is for, for lack of a, a more unique descriptor, the guy at six foot eight, 260 pounds like he, he just he has more game than some point guards in the NBA it, it feels like at times like and, and tonight I think was just the perfect example of like the full spectrum of his abilities like um very early on um pass of the year candidate the no look threading the needle to Quentin Grimes hit him in transition between three defenders all Grimes had to do was catch it and lay it in and then we, we saw the post game right he, he got the seal by running the floor in early transition pivot into a layup a, another seal like a nasty double pump um right at the rim um got to the middle of the floor like oftentimes i, I think a big issue for randall is he starts his post-ups at the elbow where defenses can kind of like tilt to one side when he's on the middle like you it's not really easy to help from either wing and, and on that play he just had a little rip through got right by kenrich williams got all the way to the rim for the layup, my favorite play of his of the game. He got a rebound, pushed it hard, third quarter. Knicks are in semi-transition, and he looks like he's going to throw the ball to Evan Fournier. But instead, it was almost like a globetrotter move. He, he, he looked like he half-passed it and then turned to a crossover, pivots the opposite direction, throws it back to Kemba Walker, who nails the three. And, and, and even, like, we talk about that kind of fanciness, what we've been asking from all years just to run hard. Like, like when he just sprinted the floor – to get that dunk um, from Evan Fournier. I think that was early fourth quarter. Um, and it was just, it was just straight hustle. It was straight effort. Like I don't blame him at all for that late pass because he was playing his ass off all game and he's played 45 minutes because Tibbs didn't want to put an OB for a couple of those minutes. And he was, he was wiped. Like he, he was just totally drained because to your point, he had to do everything against the Thunder team that it just shouldn't have taken that kind of effort um, to win. But Alex, how about we wrap up here? Quentin Grimes, uh, obviously went cold late, was really tired, but was really, really good. I, I think in regulation, he was seven for 15. He was five for 12 from three in regulation, missed those final three shots, but another spectacular game for the young rookie. And it was sort of fun. Uh, obviously, uh, Josh Giddy was ultimately the better player, but it was a lot of fun watching those two back and forth. Uh, uh, Grimes picked Giddy's pocket a couple of times. It, it was It was sort of cool to see Maybe, maybe, won't, maybe not a rivalry just because those two will play each other so rarely, but in this amazing rookie class, it, it was a cool element of this game watching those two go against each other. Yeah, it's pretty fun having Grimes be – I mean, they were talking about on the broadcast even of like obviously so many guys out of the top ten in this draft look, oh, freaking amazing. Like, you know, like Cade and uh, Mobley and Giddy and Kuminga starting to come on for Golden State. Um, you know, guys like that. But then, you know, you do have the guys that were taken later in this draft, like Trey Mann and like Quentin Grimes that are already starting to make their cases too. Is like, there, I mean, there might literally be like, like 20, you know, long-term starters that got taken, if not stars that got taken in the, you know, the, the top 30 picks of this draft, like in this first round, which is wild. Um, so it was fun to sort of see that duel. I'll just end it with, again, I mean, I just, I just got to sit in amazement again of, of, of Giddy and man on OKC. I mean, Gavin, in your wildest dreams when we were doing, not to pat ourselves on the back end, but when we were doing the, the lockdown mock draft last year and we sort of zeroed in on those two, I was a huge Giddy guy. You were a huge uh, Trey Man guy. And we sort of like zeroed in on those dudes. Would you have ever imagined that they were going to like come on this strong in their rookie years? Like, I, Giddy blows me away. I I watch him play, and I'm literally like, remember when we were saying that he was going to be kind of like less athletic, like less good, blah blah blah, Lamelo Ball. Like, I don't know about any of that. I mean, I think he just kind of looks very similar to Lamelo Ball in the way that he plays, and I feel like you're not losing too much with him versus a Lamelo. You know, at, at this point, uh, 
it just he's just such a wizard with the ball. He throws such crisp passes. And uh, the only thing I would say with him is he's got maybe one of the most janky looking jumpers I think I've ever seen in my life from three. Kind of right like Lamelo. Yeah, sort of like Lamelo, ex- except Lamelo normally makes them at a much higher rate than Giddy yeah, yeah, is right now. Although he hit three out of four in this game, including one that was like the most awkward, like leaning forward push shot of all he looks, time. He looks he's constipated really... every time he shoots. But... It's just very bizarre. But yeah, uh, you know, between him and man, I think OKC did really well for themselves in this this draft. Like those two just look really fantastic right now. The pass that he had to favors in was I can't I think it was overtime where he just sort of like flipped it like behind his back between two defenders was just sick. Like at that height to have that vision. I don't know if you saw the play he had a couple of weeks ago where I can't remember. It might have been Roby. It might have been Baisley where he just made eye contact with him and then just chucked it like 30 feet on a dead line from out of bounds to hit him for a backdoor layup. Like the dude is just a basketball savant. And it's it, it's it's so it, it's so cool. Like the two I mean, this is this is obviously a bigger picture discussion, but the two spectrums of the NBA right now where rookies are seemingly coming in more ready to play than ever before. Like, I mean, Quentin Grimes being the perfect example of that, like he, he just looks like a 10 year NBA veteran out there. And and remember earlier in the year when we talked about Grimes, we were always saying like, well, like he's a good defender for a rookie, but rookies really aren't good defensive players in the NBA. Like, no, Quentin Grimes, is just, he's just like he makes some rookie mistakes, but he's just he's, he's a good defender flat out. Uh, Giddy is 19. He was 18 at the start of this season. It was noted on the broadcast multiple times. The dude is just a manipulative savant at this point. And I was talking about the Knicks, like dearth of point guard play. I think the Knicks would like, you could flip their record if they had Josh Giddy on this team. Like, I think they'd be 33 and, and 25 instead of 25 and 33. I'm pretty, I've got off the top of my head. That's what the record is. But um, like, like he would, he would make that much of a difference as a teenager. I mean, and, and then you have the older guys like the LeBrons and the Chris Pauls. I mean, obviously those guys are legends, but are somehow still so good at 37 and it's creating an NBA where there's just more of a depth and a spectrum of talent than ever before. And it sucks that the result of that tonight was the Knicks lost to this Thunder team that on paper they had no business losing to. But that's sort of where the league is at right now. Like even even this super young team missing their two best players on the right night, they can they can beat a Knicks team that is far more talented but just vastly underperformed. Yep, that's and that's the story of the game, and that's going to be the story of this podcast because we're going to sign off now. Thank you all for listening. (laughs) uh thanks for thanks for uh suffering along in the game with us like we said we do have some draft content coming soon we're going to start getting into those discussions as the knicks trudge begrudgingly towards the the lottery here so we'll be uh we'll be bringing you guys some content for that and uh another game recap before we hit the all-star break and all that good stuff maybe we'll do something fun all-star related over the weekend or something just to not talk about the knicks a little bit but at any rate, uh, for Gavin Shaw, I'm Alex Wolf. Thanks for listening to Locked on Knicks. Peace out, everybody. Talk to you all soon.